Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a human, but he is a perfect example of how one can take his human form to be even more valuable and more greater than the angels themselves. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, brothers and sisters in Islam, was a compassionate, merciful, the most merciful of human beings, the most compassionate of human beings, the one whose heart is attached to the whole ummah, in fact, to the whole world. The first thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will remember when he is resurrected on the day of judgment is you and I. He will say, my ummah, my ummah. Wallahi, the heart is in pain to see the misunderstandings that people have if they really knew who our Prophet Sallallahu was, that the majority of people really they are ignorant and they listen to their leaders and they listen to these brainwashers. They don't know any better. And so they are being brainwashed by a small group of evil people. The average human being, my dear brother and sister, listen to me. The average human being cannot despise our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if they knew who he was. But the problem is they don't know who he is. The problem is the image that they're being presented by this group of evil leaders is a very negative image. It's the opposite of the truth. So our job therefore becomes to educate the majority of these people. We need to look at them despite what they say with the eye of compassion, with the eye of mercy. We need to look at them realizing that the majority of them, they do not know the reality of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If they did, they would not hate him. And so our job therefore becomes that we need to be embodiments. We need to be role models. We need to translate that he was truly rahmatan lil alameen. The number one mechanism in order to do this is that all of us study his life and times, understand his seerah and his biography, and then we live up to those values as much as we can. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Many teachers, when they start teaching lessons about the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam, they may start with their starting point at the birth of the Prophet Wasallam. But to really give a more comprehensive idea of the society that the Prophet Wasallam came into, it's important that we don't start at his birth, but we have to start before his birth. Before we start about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu we have to talk about the early beginnings of Meccan society and civilization in Mecca. And that traces back all the way to the time of Abu Al-Anbiya, the father of the Prophets, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, originally he was from what is modern day Iraq. And then he went to Palestine. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to go from Philistine to Mecca and to take his wife Hajar and his son Ismail alayhi salam to Mecca. It is a valley with no agriculture, no vegetation, no water, no nothing, no people, nothing. Just an empty barren land. Remember Hajar? She was the slave woman of Sar, the first wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But Sarah alayhi salam gave Hajar as a gift to Ibrahim alayhi salam to marry her because she couldn't have children. So Allah gave Ibrahim alayhi salam from Hajar a son. His name was Ismail. And after waiting for 80 or 90 years of his life for this son, Allah orders Ibrahim alayhi salam to do something amazing beyond any person's faculties of knowledge. Unimaginable. He says to Ibrahim alayhi salam, he orders him that he must take his wife Hajar and his only son Ismail who he's been waiting for for over 80 years into the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere, far away, leave them there by themselves and return back to Palestine. No questions asked. Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam did not ask why. The order of Allah came and that's enough. 
and he never explained to them where he was taking them. But he or she went with him and did not question the Prophet of Allah where he is going. She followed him. And on his way, he came to the middle of the desert and he left them there. He got up and he walked away. Hazar stood up and raced after Ibrahim and said, Ya, Ya Ibrahim. And he wouldn't respond. Ya Ibrahim. He wouldn't respond. She realized that he's leaving him there. A woman and her baby in the middle of the desert and they have a little bit of food, a little bit of water. How are they going to survive? Then she questioned him. Ila man tatrukana, who are you leaving us to? And he wouldn't answer. He didn't look at her so that he will not disobey his Lord. He doesn't want his heart to feel compassion and he will not be able to fulfill Allah's command. It was Allah who told him to leave him there. So automatically you should understand that it is Allah who will look after you. Ibrahim Salam kept walking. Finally, Hajar salam came to her senses. She stopped and said, Allahu amaraka bihada. Is it Allah who commanded you to do this? Ibrahim salam paused. All he said was one word. He said, yes. And he kept walking. At that moment, Hajar salam didn't even need Ibrahim salam. She didn't even turn to him anymore. All she said was this, إِذَنْ لَنْ يُضَيَّعَنَ اللَّهِ Okay then, Allah will not let us go astray. He's going to look after us. He will not let us perish. So our mother Hajar, السلام, the first thing to note about her is look at her knowledge of Allah Rabbul Izzah. She says, go, he will not let us perish. So Ibrahim السلام, goes to a place where they can't see him, like he walks, he, he rides away. And then when he's out of sight, he turns towards the direction of the Kaaba. At this stage, the building is not built. But Ibrahim knows that this is where the house of Allah will be. So he makes the dua, Rabbana, inni askantu min dhurriyyati biwadin. غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم O oh Lord, I have left my progeny in an unvegetated valley. There's, there's no life in sight. There's no vegetation in sight. By the foundations of your house. And then he says, ربنا ليقيموا الصلاة O oh Lord, so that they might establish salah in this place. فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ So turn the hearts of people towards them. وَرُزُقْهُمْ مِنْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ And provide them from, with provisions so that they might be grateful to you. This is the quality of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is what resulted in him being known later on. Allah says, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Allah has taken Ibrahim as a very close friend. A Khalil is a friend. He became a friend of Allah because no matter what Allah said, even if it did not make sense to him, he surrendered to it because he knew where it came from. So she went back to Ismail, her son. Sat there. Days passed. They ate and drank whatever they had, and then they ran out of it. No more food. No more water. Now comes the reliance upon Allah. And at the time of reliance, and here is a lesson. You rely upon Allah, but you also do what you can. Now she began to run between these two mountains called Safa and Marwa. She went to the first one and she climbed up it and she looked out like this. Can she see anyone? Went to Marwa, she looked out like that and she could see, see, could she see anyone? Now she's getting pa panicking and she started hurrying between these two hills. Until finally on the seventh time, she landed on Marwa. So she started on Safa and landed on Marwa. And then she heard a voice or a sound. She said to herself, Sah, Sah. It's like saying, Shh, Shh. Who are you saying Hush to? To yourself. It's like, listen, I heard something. So she came back down and the, and the sound came from where Ismail alayhi salam was. She went back to Ismail alayhi salam. And there she found a stream a fountain, a fountain of water, very wide, very big, coming out of the middle of the ground. Jibreel had descended and he stamped 
on the ground and there came out gushing water. A spring of water gushing from nowhere. She looked at it and she thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She sat down and she wanted to gather the water. So she created a basin-like structure, small little basin-like structure with her hands, with the muddy sand, clay that now became like clay and mud because it was wet. And she began to say in the language, Zam, 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 Zam. It means stop, 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 because we want to now take you and drink you. So you stop. To this day, we have this water known as Zam, Zam from the same well. And for your information, it is gushing at this moment. It is gushing at this moment thousands of gallons per hour. And millions of people across the globe drink from it. So now they have water to drink, blessed water. And they are able to quench their thirst. Alhamdulillah. Now, the Arabian Peninsula at that time, it was inhabited in places from different tribes but the original arabs the origin of the arabs is not from different parts of the arabian peninsula but it is from yemen the original arabs they came from yemen that's where the arabs were first found and they stayed there for a long time and they had a water supply in yemen they had a big water supply in yemen and they built a dam to you know to get the water from the storms and the rain and they built their civilization around that area. Now eventually something happened and that well was destroyed. So they lost that source of water. So that is why the Arabs, they left Yemen. That's when they left into different parts of the Arabian Peninsula in search for water. Because there can be no civilization without water. So they started moving around the Arabian Peninsula looking for places where they could start a civilization, but they needed water for that. So they would go here and there and different places looking for water. So there was a tribe of the Arabs. The name of this tribe was Jurhum. The name of this tribe was Jurhum and they happened to be around the Mecca area looking for a place where they could settle and find some water. And while they were passing around Mecca, they saw some birds. They saw some birds and the birds, you know, were going in a certain direction. So they thought to themselves, there has to be water around here somewhere. Because there, there's no way that there can be birds flying around this area, except that there has to be water here because birds need water too. So they decided to check up on what is happening and they sent someone, go and see where these birds are flying to. And this messenger finds a woman with a little baby. So he went back to his people, the people of Jurhum, the caravan, and he explained to them. They were very, very amazed. They came, they knew this is a miracle. So they asked the woman, do you mind if we live here? Why? Because there's water running from here. It's gushing. That doesn't happen in, the, in, the, in, in that particular desert. It doesn't happen. Water gushing from underneath. So when they asked her the question, she looked at them and responded very, very beautifully. Firstly, look at how honest they were. They were good people. If it was someone else, they would have just flicked the two of them off in, in that they would have killed them and, and took, taken the water. Because there's only two in the desert. Or they would have come and enslaved them and captured them and taken the water. But no, they asked the female, they asked her, look, can we come and stay here? Because they understood it's a miracle. So from that she realized these people have good character. They are disciplined people. They are cultured. So she said, look, you can come and stay here on condition that this water belongs to us, not to you. We'll allow you to drink from it, but it's our property, not yours. So you can drink and benefit. But subhanallah, it is not yours. To this day, Zamzam is not sold. To this day, it belongs to us all. We can drink from it. Because that Zamzam is for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they were original Arabs from Yemen and they lived around her and Ismail السلام, grew among them and he learned their language and he became among the best poets. Now Ismail السلام, and Ibrahim السلام, they were not actually Arabs. They were not from Yemen. They were not from this place. They were not Arabs. They came from Philistine area. But when Ismail السلام, settled in Mecca, you know, he he got married to a woman from the tribe of Jurhum as well. 
So the children of Ismail alayhi salam are known as Arabs who were in Arabic they say Musta'rab, meaning they were not originally Arabs. Ismail alayhi salam was not originally Arab, but he became Arab by settling there, by marrying into the Arabs and by living there in Mecca. So this was the beginning of civilization in Mecca. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam, we said he went back to Palestine, but he would come every so often and visit his son, Ismail alayhi salam. So he would come and visit every so often and then go back, come every so often and go back. And eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to go back to Mecca and to take his son Ismail alayhi salam and to build a house of worship for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son Ismail alayhi salam, they built the Kaaba in Mecca. Inna awwala baytin wudi'a linnas lalladhi bi bakka. Surely the first place of worship for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, it was in Bakka or Mecca. So as they began to build it, it got a little bit high. When it was a little bit high, what happened? Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was getting the bricks or the rocks from Ismail alayhi salam. There was no mortar used, no cement. It was just rock on rock on rock on rock. Each one was fitting into the other like a jigsaw. So what happened? As they're putting it up, now it's getting a bit high. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously caused a specific rock that he was standing on to go slightly higher. And he placed it. Then it would come slightly lower. He would get the, the, uh, the next one. Then it would go slightly higher. He would place it. Then it would come low. They knew that this is Allah. It is the house of Allah. He has shown us one too many times that definitely He is with us. That is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the house was built, there was a corner. Ibrahim alayhi salam thought to himself, I want to put a proper rock in this corner that fits flush in the corner. And he was trying to look for a, a rock and asking Ismail alayhi salam, let's put this rock. And Ismail alayhi salam is looking for something, but he couldn't find it. And later on, Ismail alayhi salam came back and he'd seen a beautiful rock there. He says, what's this? He says, Allah sent me a rock from Jannah, from paradise. This rock has come and this is what we call today Al-Hajar Al-Aswad. It is reported in one narration, one narration that that rock at the beginning was of a different color. It was white. But because of the sins of people, it changed color and became black. However, we know it as Al-Hajar Al-Aswad. We know it as the black stone. And it was placed there. So that was another miracle. Now do you want to hear the third miracle? When they were completed, they were making a dua. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept this humble effort of ours. Inna ka anta samiul alim. You are the all hearer. You are the all knower. Rabbana waj'alna muslimain lak. Wa min dhurriyatina ummatan muslimata lak. Oh Allah, make us obedient. Oh Allah, make us muslim. Oh Allah, give us the tawfiq to worship you as you should be worshipped. Oh Allah, take out from my progeny an ummah that will be muslim. Muslim, an ummah that will be obedient to you. Wa arina manasikana. Oh Allah, you've asked us to make the call. Oh Allah, tell us how to perform the manasik. Tell us how to perform the hajj. Wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Ya Allah, make me and my son, make us both obedient to you. Make us submit to you and raise a nation from our offspring. So who was with him at the time? Ismail, because Ishaq Islam hasn't been born yet. So when Ibrahim salam made that dua, Ya Allah, from our offspring, so that raised an ummah. So that ummah was going to be from Banu Ismail. Later on, Allah gave him a son, Ishaq salam, who then had another son, Yaqub. And Yaqub salam's other name was Israel. So there was, that also became a big nation. They became Banu Israel. But here Ibrahim is making dua for a mighty nation. Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatika wa yuallimuhumu al-kitaba wal hikmata wa yuzakkihim innaka anta al-aziz al-hakim. Oh Allah, send from amongst them a messenger from amongst them. Oh Allah, send Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yatlu alayhim ayatika. Muhammad will recite your verses upon them. Wa yuallimuhum al-kitaba wal hikma. He will teach them the book. He will teach them hikma. Wa yuzakkihim. Oh Allah, he will purify them. Inna ka anta al-aziz al-hakim. Oh Allah, you are the almighty and you are the all wise. 
Rabbana wabath fihim rasula. Ya Allah, among them raise one rasul. How many? One rasul. Because Ibrahim alayhi salam has done so many sacrifices. So that one rasul should be the mighty rasul. And that rasul should be a universal rasul. And not just a universal rasul, but Imam Ulambiya wa rasul. And when the time came to fulfill that promise of the dua of Ibrahim and the time had now come to make sure Nubuwat was to be ended, then Allah sent Rasulullah, the final messenger in Banu Ismail. Uh, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim, I'm the result of the dua of my father Ibrahim. This ummah owes itself to Ibrahim alayhi salam. He prayed for this ummah. An ummah which will submit itself to Allah. Do whatever Allah commands them. Uh, so this ummah is the result of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam is the result of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So we remember Ibrahim alayhi salam in our prayers. So as he's making this dua, Allah is granting him. And he's making more dua and Allah is granting him. And suddenly the rock he was standing on, it softened for a moment, just for a moment. And his footprint was left on the rock. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that footprint in the Quran. Allah says, anybody who goes to Mecca, where the footsteps of Ibrahim are, literally the physical footsteps, you need to fulfill salah for the sake of Allah at that point. Somewhere close there. So to this day, mashallah, what have they done? In order to preserve it, they've covered it up so it is protected from erosion and so on. And they have placed a metal covering on it. And it is known as Maqam Ibrahim, the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. If you look into the glass box, you will notice two feet. And that is the imprint of the feet of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. To this day, it is there. Now once he finished building the Kaaba. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a command. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ Now call the people to make pilgrimage to this house. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was surprised. He was saying, he said, I can call to it, I can call, but how are the people going to hear me? Who is going to come? Who is going to hear me? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to him, إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْأَذَانْ وَعَلَيْنَا الْبَلَاغ Surely the call is upon you. We are commanding you to make the call, but the reaching of that call to the people, that's upon us. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he goes on Mount Arafah. And then he faces the east, and then he faces the west. Every time he makes the call, O oh people, your Lord has made himself a house in Makkah al Makarramah. Come and visit the house of your Lord. Come and perform the Hajj. Come and perform the Umrah. Come and perform the Tawaf. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. When he made this call, not only did Allah convey the sound of his voice to all those that were living on the dunya, wherever it may be, even though they were living thousands and thousands of miles away from the sacred house and the blessed city of Makkah al Makarama, not did only Allah convey the sound of his voice to every single person on the earth. Allah conveyed the sound of his voice to all those that were in the heaven. Allah conveyed the sound of his voice to those that were not even born to those that didn't even come and those that were to come right till the day of judgment Allah conveyed the sound of his voice to every single one and when they heard the call and cry of Ibrahim they began to respond one after the other labbaik Allahumma labbaik labbaik Allahumma labbaik oh Allah I am here oh Allah I am here oh Allah I am here our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Today people are performing Hajj according to how many times they responded to the call and cry of Ibrahim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the hearts of the people love for this house, love for the Kaaba. And through this, through the people coming from all over, you know, making the Hajj, making the pilgrimage to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the pure monotheistic religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, it was spread in this way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone was worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. 
there was complete tawheed of the Arabs. Everybody worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and no one associated partners with him. And this went on for many years. Alhamdulillah. After some time, as we mentioned, Jurhum was the tribe that inhabited Mecca. Now there was another tribe called Khuza'ah. Khuza'ah was another tribe that came in and lived in Mecca and fought against Jurhum in Mecca to take over the leadership of Mecca. And subhanallah, for some reason or another, Khuza'ah defeated Jurhum and took over Mecca and controlled Mecca. In return, when Jurhum were defeated, what did Jurhum do? They covered the will of Zamzam. And no one knew where Zamzam is. For many years, the scholars say even for centuries, no one knew where the will of Zamzam so this is the payback that Jurhum did in return to Khuza'ah because they defeated them, they covered the wall of Zamzam. So Khuza'ah, now they had control of Mecca, but they had no water supply anymore. So they had to actually import water from the outside and bring it inside. Now the leader of Khuza'ah, he was a man named Amr ibn Luhay. Amr ibn Luhay. He was the leader of the tribe of Khuza'ah. So he became the leader of Mecca and he was a man who was very well respected by the people. Nobody disobeyed him. If he said anything, the people would obey him immediately without question. Now he traveled at one point in time, he traveled up to Asham, the area of Syria and Palestine. And when he was there, Amr ibn Luhay, when he traveled there, he saw a group of people called the Amaliq. And he noticed that they had idols, stones that they used to worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was surprised. He never saw anything like this before. So he said, what are these things that you are worshiping? What is the purpose of this? They said, yeah, these are, you know, these are our idols. When we're hungry, you know, they provide us with food. When we are in a state of fear or we are oppressed, then they help us. When we are thirsty, when we don't have anything to drink, they provide us with water. And they give us victory when we're in war. And they get us closer to the Lord of the universe. That means they used to would believe in one Lord, but these idols, they used to take them as a connection. As a connection that will connect them to that one Lord. So Amr ibn Luhay, when he heard that, he was interested. He said, can I take one back to my city can i take back one to mecca and get my people to do the same so they gave him an idol the idol was named hubal and hubal was the head of the idols in mecca even to the time of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so amr ibn luhay came back to mecca and ordered his people to start worshiping a new lord which was an idol and remember what i said his word would never become twice his people obeyed Amr, the tribe of Amr obeyed Amr, and they all start to worship these idols. And then Amr did not stop over here, but Amr ibn Luhay even commanded them to manufacture other idols. One is not enough, so we need to have a lot more around the Kaaba and in the Kaaba. So they start to do so. One for the sun, one for the moon, one for the air, one for the food, one for the kids, one for the animals, one for this, one for that. And it didn't stop over here. But Amr ibn al-Hay even started to command, each individual must have an idol in his house. And not only this, but he started to even innovate actions. He started to innovate actions. Slaughtering for the idol, this kettle for the idol, that kettle not to be touched that thing not to be done. He started to innovate things, innovate worships. From there, the worship of idols start to spread. From one person to another until the worship of the idols entered every single house in Mecca. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, By Allah, I saw Amr ibn Luhay, I saw Amr ibn Luhay dragging his intestines in the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him for that. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he is the one that changed the religion of the Arab. So they start worshipping these idols at the Kaaba, at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And like we mentioned, the Hajj had been going on from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam's call. Now, it was still going on during the time of Amr ibn Luhay. But he changed the Talbiyah. You know the Talbiyah? And we still say it today. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. Now he added a few words to this. At the end he said, La sharika lak illa sharikan huwa lak tamlikuhu wa ma malak. At the end he said, La sharika lak. Oh Allah, you have no partner except for the partners that you have. But you own those partners and you own what those partners own. So he said, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still the highest one. But he has certain partners. But he is the owner of what those partners own as well. And he's talking about the idols here. Even into the call for Hajj, he introduced shirk into that as well. And then he also said to the people, if you are ever leaving Mecca, if you ever have to go on a trip outside of Mecca, you must take a stone with you from Mecca. So that while you're outside of Mecca, you worship that stone, you pray to that stone. And when you're in Mecca, you worship the idols that we have here in Mecca. But when you're out of Mecca, you must take a stone with you and worship those stones. So this is how shirk was introduced into the Arabian Peninsula. Before, when Jurhum was still in control of Mecca, there was a situation that happened. There were a man and woman from Yemen. The man's name was Isaf and the woman's name was Nailah. And they were in love with each other in Yemen. So Isaf went to the father of Naila and proposed to her, asked for her hand in marriage. But the father of Naila refused. He rejected him. So Isaf and Naila, they were very sad about this. They really wanted to get married. So they made a plan. They said, okay, look, everyone is going for Hajj. Every year people go and make this pilgrimage. So we will go for Hajj as well. And when we're in Hajj, you know, there's so many people there. We can do whatever we want to do and nobody will know what's going on. We can do it without anyone finding out. So they made that plan and they met each other in Mecca at Hajj, at the Kaaba, at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they did an act of immorality and indecency right there at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They committed their fahisha. So to punish them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them into stones. He turned Isaf and Naila into stones. And this was before shirk came into the Arabian Peninsula. This is still during the time of uh, when Jurhum was in charge. So what the people did with those stones, just so that people will have a reminder that this is what happens when you disobey and disrespect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what happens to you. To serve as a reminder, they took the stone of Isaf and they put it on Mount Safa. And they took the stone of Naila and they put it on Marwa. So the people would see these stones and they would remember what happened to these people and they would fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They didn't worship those stones or anything. But then when Amr ibn Luhay came and he introduced idol worship back into the Arabian Peninsula, what did he do? What do you think he did? He took those stones and he put them back in front of the Kaaba and he told the people, worship these ones too. So they started worshiping those stones as well. So you know which type of society did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose to send his final and his greatest messenger. This is the society. And this type of attitude of these people, it lasted all the way up to the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And how do we know that? There is hadith of one of the companions and he said that when they would leave Mecca, if they would ever leave Mecca, they would take the stone with them. So it was still lasting up to the time right before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, there were around 360 idols around the Kaaba of various shapes and sizes. Some idols were in the shape of full humans. Some were in the shape of animals. Most of them were in the shape of half human, half animal. Also, we learn that the Quraysh had the theology that Allah has daughters and that these daughters are his angels and they would worship the angels. They would worship the angels thinking that these are the daughters of Allah. They believed in superstition. If the black cat passes, then this is happening. If the owl sits on your roof, that's happening. If a crow comes this way, that happens. We still have this jahiliya in us. And Allah says, those were the pagan Arabs. They had a lot of superstition. They used to go to fortune tellers at the time. Anything small happens, go to a fortune teller. They worshipped idols. 
so much so that they made idols out of stones and when they found a better stone they would throw away what they used to worship for so many years imagine the brains of the people and umar ibn al-khattab radiyallahu anhu he actually says as intelligent as he was he says we made a god out of dates and you know we could shape it up much more easily than stone so we shaped it up and it was so nice and one day i was very hungry asking the god for food food no food came i ate the god allahu akbar and then you find one of the habits they had they did not believe in the life after death who is going to give life to these bones after they are decomposed completely and like dust they become and allah says say he will give those bones life who gave them the life in the first place so for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create man in the first place to resurrect him is even easier when they were on the ship and when the boat rocks a little bit you know when you at sea they would call out to allah alone and as soon as they come back what would happen they would immediately start engaging in their polytheism once again, worshipping the other false deities besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the politics, at that particular time, people were divided into two major groups. You find the people of the Badiyah, the people of the desert and the people of the cities. They had something in common, very strong lineage. They were divided into tribes, families, and they literally stood up for one another. They would fight the other tribe because of a problem that it had had with one particular person. One camel goes missing, for example, and they doubted those people or someone was caught. The war lasted 40 years, 40 years. People died. The next generation did not even know why they were fighting, but they continued fighting. They had this tribalism and they had stuck to their clans. Sometimes it was used for the good and sometimes it was used for the bad. If we take a look at the leadership of these clans was always with a certain type of person and family. And usually it fell from father to child or to brother and so on. But there was something that could raise a person from nothing. What was that? If someone's level was very low, they just had to come up with some poetry, which was so powerful linguistically and full of meaning that it would instantly raise the rank of that individual sometimes to the point of leadership. Subhanallah. Why? They were crazy about eloquence. So crazy. They were the most powerful people when it came to speech. In fact, they were unlettered. The bulk of them, almost 100% of them could not read or write. But linguistically, they were powerful. They hardly used slang. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we will see later on, as he grew up, he never used slang. He was always the most powerful. It is reported that he never ever made a linguistic error in his life. Subhanallah. Nothing. That was his gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why later on we see how they looked at him and they listened to him and they were mesmerized by what he said. Subhanallah. Completely shocked. So much so that later on the Arabic language began to take its rules and correct itself through the Quran. Because that was what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. Up to this day, the Kuffar, the Christian Arabs, and those who are non-Muslims from amongst the Arabs, they still use the Quran when it comes to linguistics in order to correct their language and to explain to you what is right and wrong. Subhanallah. So if you take a look at them from the angle of their wealth, and if you look at them economically, what did they have? They did not have much in terms of produce because it barely rained. And if it did, it was all desert. But in certain spots, they had had the date palm that used to grow a lot. And they had a few other things that would grow, but very, very little. A lot of their trading happened to be with the livestock that they had had. They had a lot of camels, donkeys, as well as goats and sheep. Those who have camels, they have their noses high up in the air. We have camels and you know it's considered very expensive if you take a look at the caravans they had lots of caravans that would travel towards the north when it came to the summer and towards the south when it came to the winter because the winters up north were too cold for them to handle so they used to go down towards the south towards yemen and this is why the quran speaks about these journeys <laughs> Ilafim 
Allah is speaking of the gift of the taming of Quraysh during both of their journeys, that which happened in winter and that which happened in summer. In winter, as I said, they went south and in summer they went up towards the north. Quraysh was given a gift. They used to travel north and south so calm without anyone ever harming them. That was a sign of Allah to say Quraysh is a chosen clan. They had dealings with some Jewish people who taught them how to charge interest. And this is why in the people of Quraysh, they began to charge interest. And the Arabs at large, they charged interest. Islam protected the poor by banning interest because the interest factor makes the rich richer and keeps the poor even poorer. They used to fulfill Hajj, but what type of Hajj? It came down from Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, but they mixed it in such a way that they began to worship idols during those days. And they worshiped idols through the morning and the evenings. And they would then remember Allah as well. Allahu Akbar at times. They were very proud of their lineage and status. I am the son of so and so. Do you know who I am? I am this and I am that. Based on their father. Allahu Akbar. Women were treated as commodities. And nikah or marriage was something very, very absurd at that time. People used to marry. One category of people used to marry correctly. Where someone wants to marry, they go and speak to the, the guardians of the female and they arrange it and the nikah is done. That remained even after Islam. But sometimes they used to marry in a very strange way. A man owed another man money. So he would take his wife along, his women along. And he would say, right, you can have these. You can impregnate my wife. And when she is pregnant, you send her back to me. That child will hold your name. A'udhu Billah. Imagine what type of ignorance. Today on the globe, they have something known as swinging, where people swap their wives. It happens even in the midst of some ignorant Muslims. They swap their wives for a weekend in order to have fun. That is exactly the jahiliya of the pre-Islamic era. May Allah never return us to that. Another way of marriage was a woman who needed a bit of wealth would put a flag up by her home and people would come to her literally as though she was a prostitute. And each one would do whatever he would like and thereafter pay her a bit. And if she was expecting, she chose one of them. And she said, it's your child. And nobody could say no. So the child would be called after the man there. And she would choose the most honored so that the child could be brought up under the guardianship of some strange man. A'udhu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. The divorce of a woman. Oh, the men would just come and say, okay, I divorce you. You're divorced. And next thing they say, no, I take you back. I divorce you, take you back. And the woman, nobody would say anything because they were so embarrassed to even bear female children that whenever there was a female child, their faces would be blackened and they would become angry. They would want to hide behind the walls because of the bad news that they had just received. And they would take the child. One of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, he says, in my period of ignorance, I buried my daughter. She was so beautiful such that she was saying, Daddy, what are you doing? What are you doing? And she began to wipe off the little sand that was on my beard. And as she's doing that, I kept on putting more and more sand on her until she realized what was happening and she began to kick. And then I covered her completely and let her die. A'udhu Billah. So the Prophet wasallam asked him, this was after Islam. Didn't you feel in your heart a little bit of mercy? Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. What was around? The Persians, the bulk of them were fire worshippers. From amongst them also, we had some who worshipped idols and some who worshipped people, hierarchy. And there were so many different types of confused people. And as for the Romans, what happened to them? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. If you take a look at the story of Jesus, may peace be upon him. You will find how the Romans persecuted him and how they were tyrants. After a while, when Christianity came down, you find every king that came, he changed the Bible. And proudly they would say, King James version of the Bible. That means this is a version of the Bible which that king made and he brought it forth. Another man came, he changed it. That Pope came, he changed it. This is why today we have more than 36 different versions of the Bible. The Christians themselves cannot unite upon one. And we say this with due respect. It's a fact. As things were changed in order to suit the kings of the time, there was chaos and confusion. People started adding and subtracting. 
until they raised Isa alayhi salatu was salam or Jesus may peace be upon him to the level of Godhood and made him part of the Trinity. Then you have the wars that took place between the Romans and the Persians. These wars were from a long time. And for your information, the Persians were considered more powerful, but each one feared the other. And sometimes this one won, sometimes that one won, and it took place for a long, long time. Then you have the Indian subcontinent, where we have the Hindus and the Buddhists. And the Hindus, as you know, hierarchies. They worship people. You have the clergy, the Brahman, right at the top. And then you have the others coming down. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us from worshipping people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to remove people from worshipping other worshippers to worshipping the Rabb of the worshippers, the creator of everyone else. So we are not supposed to be worshipping the created. We only worship the creator. When I put my head down on the ground, whom am I putting it down on the ground for? Only the one who made me, no one else. In India, how a woman was treated, she was such that if her husband died, there was no chance of marrying again. Most of them burnt themselves to death because they were taught that. In this dismal darkness, our Prophet ﷺ was sent. And that is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith, that my Lord has commanded me to teach you that which you were ignorant of. And then he says, and before his coming, Allah looked at the whole world and He despised everyone. He despised them because of idolatry, because of jahiliyyah, because of paganism. Illa except for baqaya, some remnants of the people of the book. So the Prophet is describing how the world was. And that is why we call it jahiliyyah. And with the coming of the Prophet there will never be another jahiliyyah. And that is why Allah calls the Prophet ﷺ Noor. And Allah calls him Rahmatan Lil Alameen. This is the Jahiliyyah society that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ came into. And the reason why we gave this introduction is so you can see throughout the course, inshallah, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, how he turned these people from the worst of people to the greatest generation of people that mankind has ever seen. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them around 180 degrees through His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah we meet, we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad subhanallahi bihamdihi subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.